All right. Good evening to you all. Uh, my name is James uh, from Varsity Unlimited Tutors. Uh, for now, I'm just going to mute everyone so that we don't hear the background noise of where you are. But if you have a pertinent question, you are free to uh, either try to raise up your hand or you can unmute yourself and ask the question that you might have. Right. So again, my name is James from Varsity Unlimited Tutors. So what I am going to do, uh, some of you already know me, some of you do not know me. So I'm just going to introduce myself for maybe three minutes, just to highlight who I am, what I do, and etc. just for the benefit of those that do not know me. And then I will start on the class that we want to do. So today we want to look at microeconomics. That's what we want to look at today. Economics 1A or microeconomics, right? That's what we want to look at. But let me introduce myself first before we start. Right. So for those of you that do not know who I am, I am a private tutor. I want to emphasize that. I'm not a Mancosa lecturer. I am a private tutor. But what I usually do is during the month of February uh, and during the month of March and during the month of July and during the month of August, I usually offer some free lessons where I introduce different subjects to the students. And that is what I am doing today. So usually I do lessons for economics. I do lessons for business finance, for microeconomics, for management, for marketing, for business management, for IT, informatics, and etc. There are a lot of subjects that I do lessons for during that specific period of time. So these lessons, for now, they are coming from the whole of February and the first week of March. I'll be doing those lessons where I will tackle the first two or three units of your study module just as a way of helping you acclimatize yourself with the source material, helping you understand what is this animal called economics? What is this creature called business finance? That is if you do not have any background in those areas. If you have a background in those areas, then good for you. But if you do not have any background in those areas, these are the subjects, these are the lectures for you because they slow down a little bit and give you a little bit of a background so that you can catch up when your lecturer starts teaching a lot faster than what than everyone else. Right. So Varsity Unlimited Tutors, the organization that I work for, these are private tutors that just teach students. We do, uh, uh, we do charge for our services, but for now, like I said, for the month of February, it's free, so you don't need to worry about paying me anything. But if you're interested, when we get too much and you're, look, James, I really liked your lectures, and I would love to continue these private tutorials with you, then we can talk. But for now, it's free for everyone, so feel free to attend each and every link that I sent to the group. So I'll be sending the links whenever I have classes uh, in, the, what, in the various groups. All right, I think that's enough in terms of introducing myself. So now I want to talk about uh, economics. I want to talk about microeconomics. So uh, those are my numbers over there, in case you wanted them. All right. So economics is one of those subjects where if you don't have a background in it, it can be quite scary. It can be very, very quite scary. But we will try to... Uh, to make it easier for you, we'll try to break it down for you at the end of the day. So when you're looking at the subject of what economics is all about, you are studying people. Economics is about the study of people. It's about the study of human behavior. That's what economics is. The choices that people make, the decisions that people make, as they are operating within a specific economy, that's what economics is all about. So, for example, if you were to go into, uh, into spa, right, and when you get into spa, you have to choose uh, maybe the bread that you have to buy. Right. So when you're choosing the bread that you have to buy, there are different choices in terms of the bread that is available for you. There are different brands and there are different choices. The fact that you are choosing Albany bread is actually part of what economics is all about. We are asking ourselves, why did you choose this specific type of bread as an economist? We are interested in that. Or, for example, if you are getting a job, Right, and you're getting a job, you have to make a choice. Should I take job A or should I take job B? Job A, maybe it has got a higher salary, but it also has got longer hours. Job B, maybe it has got a lower salary, but it also has got shorter hours. And then you choose job B. We want to know why did an individual choose a job that has got a lower salary and lower hours than the other job that was available to them. 
So that's what economics is all about. It's about studying the choices that people make, right? It's about studying the behavior of people whenever they are making choices. Now, the question that you might ask me, James, is look, what if I don't make a choice? You will always make a choice. Now, the reason why you always make a choice is now I'm starting to introduce something that is critical to economics is because of what we call scarcity in economics, right? There is a term that we use in economics and we call it scarcity, right? Uh, scarcity means that there is not enough resources. There is not enough resources. Think of it this way. There is a limited amount of land that is in South Africa. That is why each and every one of us does not have a, a five hectare farm or does not have a 2000 square meter house because there is a limited amount of what of land that is in South Africa. So because the land is limited, right? People have to make a choice. Where should I stay? You cannot stay everywhere. You cannot build everywhere. You have to make a choice. Should I get the house in Pretoria or should I get the house in Jopek or should I get the house in Deben? Because you cannot get everything. You can only get whatever is consumer rate to the income and whatever is consumer rate to what is available. So we always make choices in economics because of scarcity. Now, you might say, James, you talked about land. What about other things? Okay, let's think of labor, right? You are a business person and you want to employ people to your company. Labor is limited. As much as there is unemployment in South Africa, labor in itself is limited. Why? Because there is a specific number of actual scientists in South Africa right now. There is a specific number of doctors in South Africa right now. There is a specific number of data scientists in South Africa right now. So the specific number of data scientists that exist means that all of the companies that want data scientists have to fight over the few data scientists that are available. So that's what scarcity is all about. We are saying there is a limited amount of resources. So because of the limited amount of resources, it therefore means people have to make choices, right? So now with the background of choices and with the background of economics, of, of sorry, of scarcity, now we can define economics properly in economic terms, which is the definition that is before you, where I said economics is a social science. Social science means that we are looking at people. That's what social science is. So economics is a social science that looks at the study of human behavior. Human behavior, it's you and me. We are what we call economic agents. So that's what human behavior is, the study of human behavior. And why are we studying human behavior? We are studying human behavior because there is a relationship that exists. The relationship that exists is there is scarcity, right? There is scarcity, which means limited resources. There is scarcity, which means limited resources. And on the opposite of scarcity, there is people that want everything. Don't lie to me. I know you want everything. You want that house by the beachfront. You want the house in the CBD. You want the house by the farm. Let's go to cars. You want a Bugatti. You want a Ferrari. You want, you want every single car that exists in your garage. You want everything, right? So there is a mismatch. There is limited resources and there is unlimited human wants, right? So because you want everything, but everything is limited, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice as an individual. So that's what economics is all about. The study of the trade-offs, the study of the opportunity cost that arises whenever an individual makes a choice, right? I believe that's the clearest way I can define what economics is all about. Now, in our study of economics, we will see that there are different branches of what economics is all about. Right? So in one area, we are going to have what is called macroeconomics with an A. And in another area, we're going to have what we call microeconomics with an I. So this semester, you guys are going to learn about microeconomics, the one with an I, microeconomics. That is what you're going to learn this semester. Then in the second semester, some of you guys will learn about macroeconomics. Some of you will not, but some of you guys will learn about macroeconomics. So let's differentiate between the two. 
So whenever we are talking about microeconomics with an I, we are talking about individual decision making. We are breaking down the economy into single units. We are saying within the economy of South Africa, there is gems, there is Lungile, there is the Stole family, there is the Lamini family, right? We are breaking down economics into individual units. There is the company called ShopRite. There is the company called Vodacom. We are breaking down economics into individual units. That's what microeconomics is all about. We are looking at specific units of an economy. I'll give you more examples a little bit later. Right. But when we are talking about macroeconomics, we are looking at South Africa as a whole. We are looking at how many people are unemployed in South Africa as a country. And we say, oh, South Africa's unemployment rate is 30 percent. We are not interested in gems per se. We are not interested in Lungile per se, but we are interested in the overall picture of South Africa. So that's macro with an A. Right. So we are looking at the unemployment rate. We are looking at the general price level, the inflation rate. We are looking at the exports and the imports of the country as a whole. We are looking at the GDP of the country, the budget of the government. So those macro issues, that's what we are looking at when we are doing with macro. But when it's micro, we are looking at individual theories at the, at the end of the day. Okay. Another way that we can differentiate economics is between what we call positive and normative economics, right? Positive economics, it's about facts, right? So for example, if I tell you right now that the unemployment rate of South Africa is 34%, that is a fact. You can go and verify it with the statistical uh, company, right? That's a fact. If I tell you right now that last year, the GDP of South Africa was 300 trillion rand, you can go and verify that fact. That is a fact. So that's what is called positive economics. When we talk about facts, in positive economics, we will also talk about theory. You will see, I think you need three, you need four, we'll start talking about theory, right? So for example, when I say, if the price of a product increases, the quantity demanded will go down. That's a theory. That's positive economics, right? It's not an idea that I have, it's a theory that has been proven, right? However, the other side of economics is called normative economics. Normative economics is whereby you look at economics from a suggestive point of view. I think that the government should give grants to the people that are unemployed so that they have something to eat on the table. This will help the economy of South Africa. You have not proven it. It's an idea that you have the value judgment that you're making. I think that the government should build more roads so that we can employ the people that are unemployed in South Africa. That's a value judgment that you're making. You don't know whether if the government starts building more roads, will they really employ more people? Will that really benefit the South African economy? Or maybe it won't at the end of the what, at the end of the day. So you're talking about what ought to be, what you think is the proper what you think is the proper way of doing things. That's what a normative economics is all about. Right? You are suggesting ideas. I think that we should have equal income in South Africa. I think that those that are earning more money should, I should pay more taxes than those that are earning less money in South Africa. Those are value judgments that you're what? That you're making at the end of the day. I hope this is clear. If, if it's not clear, you can highlight. I can try maybe to take a different angle. Or if you have got a question on the differences between these uh, the, 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 the different branches of economics. But I think it's clear from the way I explained it. All right. But like I said, guys, if something is not clear, feel free to ask. Feel free to ask. Okay. So now, this is a new study guide. Right. So I, I encourage you to after the lecture or tomorrow in your spare time, go through this table. It gives you in detail some examples of what we're talking about when we're differentiating between the two. So you can see some of these things that I focus on. I focus on them because I've seen them in your exams. Right. I've seen uh, the, the, the examiner giving you examples and saying, is this positive economics? Is this normative economics? Is this macroeconomics? Is this microeconomics? So you need to be able to tell the differences. So for example, 
if your examiner tells you that the price of one tomato increases, is this microeconomics or is this macroeconomics? That's definitely microeconomics because you're talking about a single product. But if the examiner says that the consumer price index, the consumer price index measures the prices of everything in South Africa. It measures the prices of everything in South Africa. So if he tells you that the consumer price index has increased, he's basically telling you that the price has increased, but he's telling you that the price of everything in South Africa has increased. Now that's macroeconomics. So that's what I was saying, that there are differences between our macro and microeconomics. And for now, we want to look at microeconomics, the study of individual units and how they make decisions within an economy, which will help you understand the theories behind what economics is all about. So I encourage you, I'll send this slide also. I encourage you to go through this table. It will help you understand a little bit better about the differences between macro and microeconomics. It's a typical exam question. The one for positive and normative economics and the one for macro and microeconomics. He will give you an example and he will ask you to uh, differentiate between the two. Right. So what we'll also do, I think maybe uh, the first week of March, after we have we've completed the first three units, uh, we are going to do maybe a, a, a revision class together where I bring a past exam paper and we do the units that we've done together so that you can see if you are capturing what we're talking about. Right. So now you know what economics is, right? In short, you know what economics is. You know the different branches of economics. So what I want to do, what I want to focus on this specific lecture is on the terminology of economics. I want you to understand these things because once we start getting into second gear, I will not be explaining these things. I will be expecting that you already understand what I'm talking about. So I want to explain the key terms that you will see we will repeat over and over again in the different units and in the different theories and in the different diagrams and in the different calculations that we will do in economics. That's what I want to do. I just want to give you definition of terms for today so that you understand those things. You talk like an economist. Number one, unlimited ones. You will hear this term a lot unlimited ones. So for you to understand in unlimited ones, you need to understand three key terms. What is the want, what is the need, and what is the demand, so that you understand what is an unlimited want. Right. So I'll start with the easier one. The easier one is demand. Right. If you want something and you are able to buy it, it's called demand. If I want a Range Rover and I have 700,000 rand in my account, I can go and buy it. So that is called demand in economics. And that is something that is very, very important. We're going to do a whole unit where we talk about demand, right? If you want something and you are able to buy it, it's called demand, right? Straightforward. Number two, if something is critical to your survival, it is called a need. There are things that are critical to your survival and the things that are not critical to your survival. Right? So for example, you as a person, you need shelter. You need somewhere to stay. You don't need a house per se in Deben. You don't need a house per se in Pretoria. You just need shelter. You as an individual, you need food. That's a need, a necessity, right, for you to survive. You don't necessarily need a beggar. It can be rice, but you just need food for you to survive. So that is what I need. A need is the basic necessity for an individual to survive. But however, in order for you to fulfill a need, you have a choice, right? In order for you to fulfill a need, you have a choice, which brings us to what we call a want. A want is an unlimited desire, right? I need shelter, but my desire is to have a top of the range house in a top of the range suburb. You can see that there's no limitation there. I want it top of the range. I want the best of the best that I can get, right? My need is transportation. But in order for me to fulfill transportation, I want a car. Whether the car is a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, an Aston Martin, doesn't matter, I want a car. 
that's unlimited in nature. There is no something that is breaking me in terms of what I can want, but the need is transmitted. So a want is an unlimited desire that an individual has. I hope that's clear, All right? Secondly, we talked about scarcity. I already defined what scarcity is when we're doing uh, the, the, the definition, but let's get a little bit deeper into what scarcity, scarcity really is. So whenever we are talking about scarcity, most students make the mistake of thinking about money, right? And thinking that I have limited money in my account and that's scarcity. That's not really scarcity. There are people like Jeff Bezos that have got basically like unlimited money in their account, but that's not really scarcity. Scarcity is not really about money. We don't really talk about money when we're thinking about scarcity, but we talk about the resources that are available. So in economics, the question then becomes to you, what is a resource in economics? What do we consider a resource in economics? So there are four key resources that you'll find in economics. Other textbooks will say five, but there are four key resources that you find in economics. These resources are called productive resources or are also called factors of production. The reason why they are also called factors of production is they are used within the production process. For you to get a car, you need to use the resources for the car to be produced. For you to get a house, you need to use the resources for the houses to be, uh, for the house to be what, to be produced. Uh, yes, Matetwa, the recording will be shared, right? You need to have a, a resources. So these resources, there are only four of them. Like I said, some test books will say five, but there are four key resources. Resource number one, is you're always going to need land, right? I know it's, it's a very interesting word, but you're going to need land. Some textbooks don't use the word land. They use the word natural resources, which is better because it makes more sense if you say natural resources. So when we are talking about land, we are referring to physically the land that you need. For example, in agriculture, you need like the actual land or where you can build your factory or where you can build your house. You need actual physical land. We are also referring to any natural factors, right? Natural factors, I'm talking about the trees that are on the land. I'm talking about the lakes, the seas, the rivers, the livestock, the wind. For example, if you want electricity, you need wind for you to use those wind turbines and whatnot. That's part of natural resources. That's part of land. Solar, if you are planning to create solar energy, you need the sun. What so all of those things are part of the natural resource, which is called land, and we call land a primary factor of production. It means that it is critical in the factors of production. You cannot produce without having land, no matter what you try. Right. So land is a primary factor of production. Right. It is natural. It is primary. Right. The second factor of production that you need is labor. Now labor is in two in two ways. Labor can be physical labor. When I say physical labor, just think of maybe a farm hand, right? Or a factory worker, someone who lifts things from point A to point B, someone who paints maybe a building, that's physical labor, right? That they are providing. But also I'm talking about intellectual labor. For example, maybe an engineer who's drawing the plans to your building, right? Maybe a plumber who's, uh, who's doing the plans for your house in terms of plumbing and inclusion and all of those things, right? So you also need intellectual labor, your doctors in the hospitals and et cetera. Right? So that's labor. Also labor is called a primary factor of production because you cannot produce without it, right? So those are the first two factors of production. The third factor of production is economic capital. I specifically say the economic capital there because some of you are going to think of financial capital. Financial capital is not a factor of production. Financial capital also called money is not a factor of production. But we talk of economic capital. This is a typical exam question. Question number one, it will ask you what are the primary factors of production and what are the secondary factors of production. Primary factors of production, land and labor. Secondary factors of production, economic capital and entrepreneurial skills. Second exam question that you can get will be, is money 
a factor of production. No, money is not a factor of production. Financial capital is not a factor of production, but economic capital. So what is economic capital? Economic capital is anything that you use to produce that is man-made, right? So I want to give you a straightforward example. James, for example, the person who's giving you the lecture, right? I have a business called Varsity Unlimited Tutors where I am teaching you guys. In order for me to be able to teach you, I need a laptop. A laptop is not natural. A laptop is man-made. So the laptop is economic capital. Example number two, if you go to the farm, they have land, they have labor, but they also have a tractor. A tractor is man-made. A tractor is economic capital, right? If you go to a company that does warehouses, like take a lot, right? They have land, they have labor, but they also have got a factory, a warehouse. That warehouse is man-made. It's also a economic capital. I hope I've explained myself there. Right, and then we go to uh, number four, entrepreneurial skills. Right, entrepreneurship is a factor of production. Now, if you take land, capital, and labor, and you don't have someone who is willing to take the risk of going into business, you are going to fail. Right, you need entrepreneurs within an economy. You need the risk takers. You need the people that are willing to take economic capital that are willing to take land, that are willing to take labor, that are willing to go into business and establish factories in order for us to produce as an economy. And we call those people entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship is a key factor of production, although it's under the secondary factors of production, right? So the ability to organize resources in order to produce and make a profit is called uh, entrepreneurship. Right. Then the last resource, which I said, some textbooks go a step further, like the recent textbooks, the older textbooks, they will tell you four, but the more recent textbooks, they will tell you that technology is a factor of production. However, most older textbooks, they include technology under economic capital. They include technology under economic capital, but there are a few textbooks that then take the technology separately as the fifth factor of production, right? So before I go back to what I want to go back, I want to highlight something that is important here. So these factors of production in any normal economy, they are owned by individuals. They should not be owned by the government. The land of an economy, the labor of an economy, the economic capital of an economy, the entrepreneurial skills of an economy are owned by you and me. I am the one who's supposed to have the land. I am the one who's supposed to have the labor. I am the one who's supposed to have the capital and the entrepreneurial skills. So we own these factors of production as people. Now, because I own a factor of production, there is a reward that I get from ownership of a factor of production. A good example is labor. If I own labor, I can get to a company and I will be paid what? A salary, a wage rate, right? If I own the entrepreneurial skill, I will be paid a profit. Because I'm a business person, I will be paid a profit. If I own land, I should be getting rentals for the land that I own. If I have land, I should be getting rentals for whatever land that I own. Which means anyone who wants to use my labor, pays me a salary. Anyone who wants to use my entrepreneurial skills gives me a profit. Anyone who wants to use my land gives me a, a rent. But this is where most students will then lose it now. Because when we talk of economic capital, the reward for economic capital is interest. Interest is in you take money to the bank and you're paid interest. That's the reward for economic capital. But don't overthink it. For now, just know that the reward for economic capital is interest. But financial capital is not economic capital. Right. So we are done with these resources. Let's go back. Okay. So I've highlighted what unlimited want is. I've highlighted what scarcity is. And I said scarcity refers to resources. We are saying that there is limited land there is limited entrepreneurial skills. There is limited economic capital. There is limited um, uh, labor. 
So scarcity refers to the limitations that are placed on our resources as an, as an economy. Now, when you match unlimited ones and scarcity, you create choice, right? So I'll give you another example. Right? So in an economy such as South Africa, right, we can um, manufacture wheat, right? We can manufacture fruits and vegetables. We can use the land that we have to create factories to produce cars and whatnot. We cannot do everything. I want that to be clear. We cannot do everything as an economy. We have to select what we want to do. Just think of it, a farmer. If a farmer is with one, egg, one, one hectare of land or one hectare or whatever it is, right? They cannot produce cabbages, carrots, mangoes and whatnot. They have to choose because they have limited land available to them. So when you make a choice, you have to forego something. So if you've got one hectare of land and you decide that I am going to grow cabbages, but you were also interested in growing tomatoes, but because you have limited land, you can no longer grow the tomatoes. In economics, we call that an opportunity cost. We are saying that you had the opportunity of growing tomatoes, but because of the limitation of the resource of land, you have only grown cabbages. Therefore, your opportunity cost is the tomatoes that you would have grown. But let's bring it home, right? There is what we call there's no free lunch in economics, right? You have got one hour during your lunch hour, right? You've got one hour during your lunch hour. You can either go out and enjoy your lunch, right? You can either go out and enjoy your lunch or you can go and what? And shop, maybe buy some uh, clothes for your, for your children. If you decide to go and shop, it means you are no longer going to enjoy your lunch. So you, you, you cannot say that, oh, I had a free lunch. No, you did not have a free lunch. You went and shopped. And the, when you shopped, it costed you. The supper, the, the 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 lunch that you were supposed to eat, the rest that you were supposed to get at the end of the what? At the end of the day. So whatever choice that you make, there is always going to be a cost. If you decide to get into tax number A, you would have gone with Uber. If you decide that I want to buy this specific dress, you have chosen not to buy a specific slack. If you decide I'm going to buy this specific cell phone, you have chosen not to buy maybe a laptop, a tablet, or whatever. You have forgone something. You have lost something, an alternative. So opportunity cost is the thing that we give up whenever we make a choice. The official definition says it is the value of the next best alternative that has been foregone when we made a choice the value of the next best alternative that has been foregone when we made a choice. Now, this one has got calculations, opportunity cost. It has calculations. We are going to do this maybe in two or so weeks. We are going to do some calculations for, economy, for opportunity cost together. For now, let me just look at the definitions. All right. Then lastly, by now, I think you understand the difference between scarcity and poverty. Poverty and scarcity are two different things. Scarcity means the resources are not enough. Poverty means you as an individual, you might not have a good portion of the resources. Someone might have a better portion than me, but for everyone, we face scarcity. Each and every one of us. Whether you are Jeff Bezos, right? You've got a billion dollars in your account. You still have a problem of scarcity. Not everything that you want, you will get it. That is why he's still in business. Because you will not get everything that you want. There is a limited amount of land. There is a limited amount of resources that are available for him, right? Although he might be richer than me and you, but he also faces scarcity, although he might not have poverty, right? So I think I've defined this correctly. Let's look at some other terms that we can look at. Uh, are we still good in terms of our time? Yeah, good. All right. So uh, in our units number um, uh, two, three, and four, we are going to talk a little bit about goods. Right. So in economics, when I say a good or when I say an economic good, I'm going to use those things interchangeably. Good and economic good, I'm going to use those things interchangeably. So when I say a good or an economic good, I'm referring to any good or a service that you have to buy for you to get it. 
So for example, if I want a chair, if I have to buy a chair for me to have a chair, that's an economic good. Or for example, if I want uh, banking services, I want someone to offer me loans, uh, bank account and all of those things. That's a service, but that's also an economic good. If I want to visit the dentist and the dentist will make me pay to fix my teeth, that's an economic good. So an economic good is any good or service that you have to pay for, for you to get. So this means if you don't have to pay for something, then it's not an economic good. It's now what we call a free good. A free good is something that you do not have to pay for, which means it is abundantly available. However, don't mistake public goods and free goods. Those are two different things. A public good is something that you do not pay for directly. So for example, uh, the street lights in your, in, your, in your own suburb, if you go outside your house right now, there are some street lights that the government put that you enjoy. If you walk outside, they'll be lighting in water. They are not free. You are paying for them. But you're paying for them using the rates that you pay each and every what? Each and every month. So they are in public good. Although you do not directly pay for them, but you're still paying for them. Or maybe subs, South African services, right? Police services, right? They are make sure that you are protected. If someone tries to steal your things, they come and recover it for you. South African defense, they make sure that every the country is corrected. They go and fight the wars for you so that you don't go to war yourself. You are enjoying that. Are you paying for it? Yes, you are paying for it through your taxes. You are not directly paying for it, but you are still paying for it through your taxes. So that's a public good, right? Then consumer goods. A consumer good now, this is now part of economic goods. So if you take an economic good, you can define an economic good between consumer good and capital goods, right? A consumer good is anything that you consume currently. For example, if you buy a television, you're going to watch it. You're going to enjoy your television. That's a consumer good. If you buy a refrigerator for your house, you're enjoying it. That's a consumer good. If you buy food, a beggar, you're enjoying it. That is a consumer good. You are is for current consumption. But a capital good is economic capital. It's something that you use in production. If I buy a delivery vehicle for the company, yes, I am consuming the delivery vehicle, but the reason why I'm consuming it is so that I can generate future income for my business. So that's a capital goods. Anything that I use in production of other goods becomes a capital good, right? Again, we can take economic goods and we can uh, subdivide them into intermediate and finished goods. This is especially when we go to second semester, we're going to talk more about this. Intermediate goods are goods that have not yet been finished. So for example, wheat is an intermediate good. If I give you wheat right now, you can't do anything with wheat. What are you going to do with it? But what you want is bread. Bread is the final product. That's the final good. Wheat is intermediate because you need to grind it, you need to bake it for you to end up with bread. So wheat is an intermediate good, whereas bread is a final uh, product. All right, I think this is clear. All right, so I'm done now with my definitions. I'm going to go now into the last part of my lecture, which is now introducing you, why do we study economics? Why do we study economics? I don't know, is there any question on what I've talked about now before I talk about why we study economics? Is there any question on what I've talked about right now? All right, I believe everyone is happy. No, the reason why we study economics is because in each and every economy, whether it's South Africa, it's Botswana, it's Egypt, it's the United Kingdom, in each and every economy that exists, there is an economic problem. It's called the basic economic problem. You will get an exam question asking you what is the basic economic problem. It's called the basic economic problem. The basic economic problem is how do we manage the mismatch between unlimited wants and limited resources? How do we manage the mismatch between scarcity and alternative uses? How do we manage the, how, or how do we allocate resources between the different desires, wants, and needs that people have within an economy? That's 
the economic problem. Each country is facing. They look, look, we have got uh, 12 million hectares of land in South Africa. We have got 40 million people that are willing to work within the country. We have got a, a trillion worth of uh, economic uh, capital, right? We have got 53,000 entrepreneurs in South Africa. How do we manage these limited resources in order for us to produce enough bread, enough clothes, enough computers, enough medicine, enough whatever for everyone that is in the economy? That's the basic economic problem. And that is the reason why we study economics, in order for us to answer this basic economic problem. Right. So this basic economic problem can be subdivided into what are called the three economic questions. These three economic questions are now the different units that we will study when we're doing economics. The first question is the question of what to produce. Secondly, how to produce. Thirdly, for whom to produce. Now let's talk about what to produce. So when I'm saying what to produce, I'm asking you as a household, as a person, as a business, what should South Africa produce? Should we produce computers? Should we produce cars? Should we produce motorbikes? Should we produce clothes? Should we produce medicine? Should we produce food? Should we produce furniture? What should we focus our production as a country on? Right. So that's what, that's the question of what to produce. We have some resources, we have some land, we have some labor. So what should we produce as an economy or as a business? What should we produce or what should we manufacture? That's another term that you can what that you can use. So that's question number one. Question number two, right? Is now we are asking ourselves, how do we produce? Let's say that we have decided that we want to produce bread. We want to produce wheat, right? How do we produce wheat? How do we produce bread? Do we take the land? And we put all 40 million South Africans there on the land, and then they start planting the wheat with their hands and what not. Or do we only take maybe 10,000 South Africans, and then we take 10,000 tractors and put the tractors on the land and each, each of the employees on the tractor? Do we do that? Right. So how do we produce? What amount of technology are we going to need? How do we combine the different resources? The issue of combination, right? How do we combine the different resources? How much technology, the fifth factor of production, how much technology do we use within our production process? So that's the question of how do we produce? So the question of what to produce, we are going to talk about uh, demand and supply theory. We are going to talk about uh, consumer theory, right? Theory of the consumer. We are going to talk about in different cases, right? Under what to produce. But under how to produce, we're going to talk about market structures. We are going to talk about uh, the uh, theory of production. We are going to talk about the cost of production within an economy. We're going to talk about elasticity, right? So that's the issue of how to produce. But lastly, I'm going to ask you a question and say, after we have decided that we wanted to produce bread, and we decided that we are going to produce bread using a lot of technology and a lot of tractors. Now I have 10,000 loaves of bread. Who am I going to give these 10,000 loaves of bread? How am I going to distribute these 10,000 loaves of bread? Should I say all of South Africa stand up in a line and give each and every one a loaf of bread? Or should I put the bread in the shops and charge 20 rand for each loaf of bread? Or should I put all of the loaf, sell the bread to spa and let spa decide how much they want to charge for the bread? It's a question. How do we distribute the, this bread? What is going to be the price at distribution? Who is going to get the bread? What if someone wants the bread and they don't get it? Right. Now we are talking about issues of uh, uh, equitable distribution of resources. Some people are poor. They may not afford the bread, but they want to eat. So for whom do we produce or for whom do we distribute? Right. So those are the three key economic questions. Now I'm going to go into extra time. Right, just give me maybe uh, five minutes or so, just some extra time. In each and every economy, these questions are answered differently. Remember, there are three questions. 
they are answered differently by each and every economy that you see. The way these questions are answered in South Africa and the way they are answered in the US of A is different from the way they are answered in China. So this is now where you see, if you've ever heard those words used, capitalism, uh, communism, and all of those things. Those are different solutions to answering these three economic questions, right? Those are different solutions that have come up to answering these three economic questions. So there are four solutions currently that we can talk about. The first one is no longer relevant. This is what we call the traditional economy. This is maybe in your 1600s, way, way before all of us were born. This was the economy that existed then. Right, the feudal economy where they had kings and queens and all of those things. So we don't discuss about that in economics, it's no longer relevant, right? But the next one is still a little bit relevant, although it's now also going out of out of order. The command economy. So if you talk about the command economy, think of countries like this is not a good example, but think of countries like Cuba, countries like Russia, countries like um what is this one, China. Right? They are no longer command economies, but these are the best examples that I can give you right now. So a command economy is an economy where they set up a central authority. There is like a, a, a committee, maybe with 50 people or something like that, that decide for the whole country. They decide that this year we are going to produce 20 tons of wheat and we are going to produce 50,000 loaves of bread. We are going to produce 20,000 cars and we are going to produce uh, uh, 30 tons of clothes that we are going to give to the people. Once we have produced these things, we are going to ration them out. Each individual, if I don't know if you've heard this story in Libya, where they used to say that when you get to 20, you get a house or something like that. So that's how a command economy works. The government decides what to produce and how the people get the resources of that part of that country. So the best country so far that might still be doing this is Cuba. But all the other countries really, uh, Russia, yes, they still have some command issues there, but not really. Even China is not really there. But I think the best one would be Cuba at the moment. But anyway, it's no longer really relevant because this economy no longer really exists. Now, the next one is called the market economy. Now, this one is popular, although it's difficult to also get this economy, but it's called a market economy. A market economy is where there is no government. Inter I'm not saying there's no government. I'm saying there is no government intervention within the market. The market operates separately from the government, right? So there are business people, there are consumers in the market, and they do what they do. The government regulates the police and the air force and whatnot, but they don't get into the market. They are not interested in what is happening to the market at the end of the day. So there's what we call a self-interest, free market forces, those sort of things. I don't know if I should define this if they're necessary. Right, let, let's get into it. So for example, uh, I'm just trying to define something here, just be patient with me. So for example, the question of what to produce. In a free market economy, me as James, right? I love uh, cell phones. So because I love cell phones, I am willing to pay uh, 20,000 rand for the best cell phone available. And I believe the best cell phone available is a smartphone with a 20 megapixels camera with an, uh, you know, uh, Intel Core, whatever, 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 right? So because of that, I signal to the market that I am willing to pay 20,000 for a good smartphone. Samsung and Apple, they decide what to produce because they see that if we produce a cell phone that is not a smartphone, gems will not buy it. So out of self-interest and out of the desire to make profit, they will only produce the product that they know that the consumers are willing to buy. Then me also as gems, out of my own self-interest, I will also only buy things that give me utility, things that make me happy. Right? Then when I interact with the market, then there is what we call a market force that determines what the price should be. Whether the price is going to be 15,000 or 20,000 depends on how many people want the phone and how many suppliers are selling the phone. If there are more people that want the phone and less suppliers, the price will be high. If there are more suppliers and less people, the price will be low. 
So that self-interest and the market forces that answer the questions of what, how, and for whom we produce within a market economy. Then lastly, you are going to have what we call the mixed economy. The mixed economy is now a combination of the market economy, but with government intervention. This is what we have in South Africa, the mixed economy. So the market will operate separately. But the government will come into the market. For example, uh, you guys know what are called, um, uh, what are these things? Minimum wages, right? A minimum wage, what a minimum wage is. A minimum wage, it means that you cannot pay your employee below a certain price. But that is the government that is saying. So they have come into the labor market and they've seen that it is necessary to put a minimum wage to protect the workers in the labor market. So the government is intervening within a particular market. They can come to a market and say, oh, your prices are too expensive. People will starve. So this is the maximum price that you can charge for bread. You cannot charge bread for more than 30 rand or something like that. So that's intervention. They don't do it often, but here and there, you can see that the government is intervening within the what? Within the economy, right? So that becomes a mixed economy where there is both uh, intervention of the government and where there is also the market forces that are found within a what within a economy. So budget system is where countries like USA, Hong Kong, Australia, these are market systems. Countries like South Africa are your command systems. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about uh, today. This brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about with you today. Now, in my next lecture. I'm going to go a little bit deeper, right? In my next lecture, I will now introduce graphs. I will introduce calculations. So we are going to talk about the production possibility curve. We are going to talk about opportunity cost and the calculations that are tied to opportunity cost. So that will be my next lesson. So for those of you that are following, I am making use of your study material. I'm also making use of your recommended test books. So some of the information that I will say will not be in the study material, but will be in your recommended test book. Some of the material that I might highlight, they may not be in your study material, but they're in your recommended test book. The reason why I say it is because I know it will be in your exam. I know it will be in your exam. So I will not leave, even if it's not in your study guide, I will say it because I know it will be in your exam. I don't want you to get surprised when you get to the exam at the end of the uh, semester. So the next class for economics is going to be on Sunday at uh, either seven or eight o'clock. I'll just confirm, but let's plan for seven o'clock. Sunday, seven o'clock, that will be the plan. I just need to check load shedding. You know how load shedding is these days. I just need to check that. But the next lesson for economics will be on Sunday, either seven or eight, depending on the load shedding schedule, right? And then uh, for the guys that are doing business finance, we will meet on uh, Monday next week for the guys that are doing business finance. And then for the other modules, such as introduction to business management, uh, informatics, and etc., I have lined up the lectures for next week. I've lined up the lectures for next week I'll be sending. But for this, for the rest of this week, I will not be having any lectures until Sunday, until Sunday evening at seven o'clock. Are there any questions for me? Yeah. Before we dismiss it for the night, are there any questions for me? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Go ahead. Yes. Um, I'd like to know. I heard you say um, you'll be working uh, with with study guide and uh, recommended the test book. Mm -hmm. So you suggest us we get the recommended or prescribed books, or we should get them uh, both. All right. So I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it this way, right? Um, for any student that knows that the let's say for example you say I I cannot afford to get private tutorials from you, James. Thank you for the free lessons, but definitely I will not be able to afford to get private tutorials. If you want to buy the test, buy the prescribed test book buy the prescribed test book if you want to buy the test book. But for those of you that, you know, want to, to, to get extra classes from me, don't worry about the test book because I'm already teaching you from the test book. So you don't need to spend more money and go and buy the test book again. It will not really benefit you anything. 
was you will not have time to read it. I will teach you from the textbook myself to make sure that you capture that what that content that is in the textbook. So if you are going, if you are planning to be joining my classes, don't worry about the textbook. I bought the textbook myself. I'll cover the material that are in the textbooks. But if you're not joining my classes, buy the prescribed textbook. Buy the prescribed textbook. I hope you answered. Another question? Uh, can I also ask how much are you charging uh, for your lessons? Okay. So for those of you that would be interested in joining the classes, like I said, February is going to be free for everyone. We are going to do maybe two units or three units in February. It's going to be free. Then the fee will be 800 rand for each module. For those of you that want to continue with my classes, it's 800 rand for each module that I teach you. This 800 rand covers you for, number one, the classes that we'll be doing together, these classes. Number two, it covers you for one-on-one -on -one assistance with your assessments. You have got three assessments that you need to do. Assessment number one, assessment number two, you'll be covered a one-on-one -on -one assistance for those first two assessments. Then the, the 800 also covers exam preparation where towards the exam, we go through maybe three or four past exam papers together where we do the past exam papers. I tell you what the answers are, how you were supposed to answer, et cetera, in the preparation for the exam at the end of the semester. So 800 rand for each subject, for each module that you would love assisted with me. It's payable in installments. I'm a very, you know, it's payable in installments. You can do, I want 200 here, 200 next month, 200 what month, that's fine with me. It's payable in installments. That is for the ones that, who want to continue with the classes in March with me. But for February, it's free. Don't worry. For February, it's free. I know sometimes you're not yet budgeted and whatnot. You're paying your school fees. So for February, it's free. But if you want to proceed in March, that will be the budget. I hope you answered. Okay. Someone says, James, can we start making payments? Uh, month end of February. Not now. Right now, please watch the lectures. If you are happy, you can tell me if you want. I can add you to say, uh, to my potential students and say, okay, these are the students that are interested in the class. I'll add you to a separate group, right? So that when, when we start making the payments, you can start making them. But for now, I'm not really taking any payments. I want you to see what you're paying for. That's my policy. I don't want you to pay and then later complain. I want you to see what you're paying for. So if you're making payments, it will be end of February, month in February. So budget for month in February if you want to pay for the lessons. Budget for the month in February. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for me? Hi, James. Yes, um, I just want to know, for our Sunday night, uh, session, are we only going to cover unit two or three as well? For what? Sorry? For Sunday session, mm -hmm. how many units are we going to cover? Is it going to be one unit or two units? Unit two and three or just unit two? Uh, I, I haven't looked at your assignment directly, uh, but uh, what I do know is uh, for microeconomics. Okay, remember guys, there are two different groups in here. Please take note of that. So what I'm going to say might not apply to some of you guys. For the guys that are doing advanced diploma in business management, right? Your assignment number two, it covers um, a demand. It covers a lot of the info information there is about demand, which is your unit number three. Unit number three and unit number four. That's what the assignment number two mainly covers. But assignment number one, it usually covers unit one, unit two, and unit three. Right. Assignment number one covers unit one, unit two, and unit three. But assignment number two, it mainly covers the units on demand and elasticity. I think which is unit number three and unit number four. I will have to verify that I have to really check that, that part. Okay. Right. I answered you. Anything else before I go, guys? All right. Then if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call tomorrow in the morning. Right now, you might not get hold of me because I need to uh, to drive from the office. I'm at the office at the moment, so I just need to drive home. So I might not be able to answer your call, but just call me in the morning, and then I can answer any questions that you might have. That is for those that want extra classes, that want extra help with their, with their studies, because we also do that. All right. So guys, I hope you enjoyed. I will see you this weekend on Sunday. Uh, remember Sunday, 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. 
we'll meet again uh, to do our next our next uh, our next chapter which is going to be production possibility cap good night thank you good night good thank night. you bye bye good night good night thank you bye bye thanks bye